check. Oh, hello. Okay. Yes, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm so happy you made it out here today to hear me ramble about my life. Um, I don't really know what you're thinking when you made that decision, but I hope you'll at least be entertained for the next 20 minutes or so. Um, this is different from the talks I usually give, which tend to be more technical. Um, you can search for some of those later if you're interested. The content today is going to be um, a lot lighter. So who am I? I'm Anita Zhang on the tin. I'm currently a software engineering manager at Meta, nay Facebook, for what I call the Linux umbrella family of teams. Um, prior to that, I was a software engineer at Meta for about six years. Um, my official work title is Engineer D, Manager D, as a callback to when I was the primary system D maintainer for Meta. Uh, for those who don't get the reference, all system D daemons end with D. Um, before I was known for either of those things, I wore many hats. Um, I was the Certificate Authority Wrangler, the president of the D T Club, and my personal favorite, honorary production engineer. Um, as a manager, my engineers probably have other nicknames for me too. I always get a chuckle when someone calls me boss. <laughs> I think it's important to have a uh, identity outside of your employer. So here are some things people may or may not know me for. Um, I am actually a proud dog owner. Um, my husband and I adopted Bella, uh, May 2023, from our local shelter. She is now one and a half, and she's very smart. Um, however, she is going through her adolescent phase right now and has become very vocal, opinionated. She basically owns the house and these slides now. The remainder of my presentation is just going to be pictures of Bella. Yeah. I know, dog photos, yay. <laughs> Um, I am a Linux enthusiast. I started using Linux around my university days when I also fell in love with operating systems development. I basically haven't stopped using Linux since. I guess that's how I ended here today. Um, I am also a fan convention volunteer. I've been the stage manager for BronyCon, and today I still volunteer and staff a bunch at my local anime conventions like FanimeCon and YumeCon. And I'm also a small Asian girl, so we'll just go ahead, address the elephant in the room, namely me, um, having gone to many Linux conferences and now this one. Uh, women are still kind of the minority demographic, and the intersection between like Asian and female is even smaller. Um, but on the plus side, I am very easy to identify in a crowd. Um, the title of my keynote is a little tongue-in-cheek, but also a bit serious. Um, even until my later undergraduate years, I didn't really have dreams of like going into tech or computers. Um, I saw computers as fun and useful. I thought that maybe I would do like some hardware stuff at some point. Um, but recalling some of my peers in university and like seeing some of the new grads that apply to internships at Meta these days, um, I feel kind of like a lot of them have been intentionally working towards big tech their entire lives. Uh, and while I don't know if I would recommend that path to getting into tech, I probably also wouldn't recommend mine. So I was born and raised in San Francisco in a relatively tight-knit Chinese community. Um, I think as an adult, living in the city is like awesome. And as a kid, it's really convenient. Um, there's a certain level of independence you kind of learn early on from living in the city. Uh, my parents were immigrants from China who came to the U.S. in their early 20s. They had a pretty stereotypical hope for me and my younger siblings. Get a safe, stable, low physical intensity job, like a pharmacist at Walgreens. Um, we lived down the street from Walgreens, and I'm sure they would have loved it if I went to like a university nearby, worked at Walgreens, and lived with them for the rest of their lives. I kind of grew up at a time when San Francisco's public school district started adding computers to the curriculum. Um, I remember playing math games and like learning to touch type with Mavis Beacon. And in later years, the computer labs like all stocked the Apple iMac G3, you know, like the big CRT style all in one. Um, we learned to use Microsoft Office Suite during class. I played like a lot of Oregon Trail on the side. And like a lot of my friends back then, I eventually got my first coding experience by learning to write HTML on Neopets and later MySpace. So 
So the first computer my parents ever gave me was like an HP desktop with Pentium 4 running Windows XP. Um, I'm pretty sentimental, and this one had a special place in my heart. No matter how much it failed me, I like refused to let it die. The power supply blew out, and I kind of replaced it with a more powerful one. Uh, when I got slow, I added more RAM. Insert joke that like downloading RAM. Um, at one point, I even thrifted a GPU to put in um, this computer. And when my friends came to visit, they would always complain about like how slow my computer was because they had like the newest stuff. But it didn't bother me too much since I was kind of saving up for bigger things. And I also had a lot of fun hacking on it. Um, my mom in particular had a very stereotypical outlook on things. Um, you know, boys build things, girls do housework. Of course, she made me do plenty of housework too. Um, but it must have kind of perplexed her to see me taking my PC apart and like putting it back together so much. But it, for me, it was like extremely frustrating to have her nag me about doing so-called boy activities when school was also trying to like get more girls into STEM. Um, but I was young and it was kind of easier to say nothing and move on. Um, I learned early on that if I didn't cause trouble, I could kind of do whatever I wanted. In high school, we had a volunteer counselor named Ms. Kornblith. So she's one of the first people who changed my life. Uh, Ms. Kornblith introduced me to Carnegie Mellon's pre-college program. Um, at the time, I wasn't even aware that like, Carnegie Mellon existed and like, what a reputation it had. Um, but I managed to convince my parents to let me go across the country for the summer because I kind of had a full scholarship for those with financial need. And I kind of used that excuse that it was like good for ap college applications and stuff. So Carnegie Mellon's pre-college program had many sub-programs under it. Um, I suppose that if I was a bit more academic focused, I would have just taken unicor university courses for the summer. Um, but I had different motivations. I absolutely loved video games. And so I attended the National High School Game Academy. The idea behind the Game Academy is that over like the course of six weeks, you take classes, do homework, and learn from industry professionals about what it's like to work at a video game company. And all of this culminates in like a final demo that you create with a team. And contrary to where you think this story is going, I did not end up in the software development track at the Game Academy. I was actually in the art track. I had a fantastic summer sketching, and learning how to 3D model. Don't tell my mom that, she doesn't know. <laughs> the next semester, it was time to apply to college. And after what a great time I had at Carnegie Mellon, um, obviously it would be the number one choice. But as part of the application process, you have to pre-select a major from one of many schools from within the university. So did I apply to the College of Fine Arts after spending the whole summer drawing? No. What about the School of Computer Science? Because computer science is hot. Also no. Um, I actually ended up in the College of Engineering. So remember how I used to hack up my old computer? Uh, well, electrical and computer engineering was the major to be in if I wanted to learn all about that. And saying it out loud now, it sounds a little illogical, but I'm sure it made more sense in my head at the time. So let's talk about my first experience with Linux. Um, out of necessity, I was kind of forced to become a Linux user in the sense that like all the remote machines at Carnegie Mellon were running Linux. Um, if I remember correctly, it was either some version of like Red Hat Enterprise Linux or CentOS. Um, but I really only learned the bare minimum to get my coursework done. I had a lot of gaps in my knowledge about what Linux was and what made it special. I didn't really get into Linux until later when I had money for my own laptop. And at the time, it was the era of like tiny things and being minimal. Uh, I kind of got swept up in the hype and, and, and you know, had the mindset that like minimal is good. Use as little CPU and memory as possible. Don't use a heavyweight desktop environment. So I ended up using the smallest environment I could tolerate while using Fluxbox. Um, this first Linux laptop was my daily driver. Everything was muscle memory and like distilled into like a series of shortcuts that I eventually forgot. Um, I learned to use GenuScreen and Vim, both of which I still use today. 
And then I started to learn about packages and all the different repositories, and fiddling with everything was so fun. And it was amazing that I could make every piece of the system my own. The other thing that contributed to my Linux enthusiasm, especially the systems aspect, was the operating systems course at Carnegie Mellon. Of all the computer science courses they offer, um, OS was known for being infamously difficult, uh, but it also had like a reputation for changing your life. So what happens is you and a partner spend most of your semester writing a preemptive multitasking kernel for x86, complete with context switching, scheduling, virtual memory drivers and interrupts, and all of this is from scratch. Uh, needless to say, I kind of fell into the hype, and when I finished OS, I felt enlightened. Um, I became super passionate about computer systems, and I loved everything about it. I loved race condition problems, I loved debugging, I loved dissecting code and like kind of creating that mental model of a system. There's kind of something magical about like understanding all the pieces of software needed to run like a simple binary. Um, so there is a course that comes before OS. Um, every computer-related major at Carnegie Mellon also requires you to take Introduction to Computer Systems. And doing well is actually a prerequisite for being able to take OS. The first time I took Introduction to Computer Systems, I dropped out halfway. I don't remember exactly why, but I didn't do well. I hadn't paid enough attention to the lectures or something. The material just wasn't clicking for me. And during this time, I paid a visit to our department advisor, Jessica. Jessica really dug into like, the fact that I was a first-generation American-born Chinese with like, the pressure of also being first in my family to graduate from college. And she kind of acknowledged the stigma that comes from dropping a course when you're in that position. You know, therapy might have been more suitable, but it was not normalized yet. Um, instead, I had Jessica, and she was like, there to help change my life once again, um, get me through this hurdle. Um, when I walked out of her office that day, I felt better about quitting, and I dropped the course. And I'm really glad I did, because I did a lot better the second time around, and had a much better foundation for OS. So when I finished OS and thought about my first failed experience with computer systems, I felt motivated to become a teaching assistant. And prior to this, I never had any aspirations to teach. Um, first of all, I had a little bit of lingering social anxiety stemming from my childhood when some kids made fun of me for my accent. And up until my teens, I was also scared to death of even talking to waiters at a restaurant. Um, but there were certain parts of the course that I had really struggled with that I thought could be presented differently. Um, and it also felt like a disservice that the course wasn't making an effort to show people how awesome computer science, um, systems were. And so I pushed myself to become one of the teaching assistants to try and change that. Teaching assistants do a bunch of things like host office hours, grade exams, and like teach their own recitation class. And I took my own liberties with some of the material in order to present it in a more friendly way. Um, I had a lot of fun putting my own twists on things and helping other students with their own computer system struggles that I ended up being a teaching assistant for the remainder of my college career. So during one of these um, summers in college, I worked as a teaching assistant for this course. Um, and the notable thing about that summer is that out of necessity, we had to deliver and grade all of the exams digitally. And I'm so sorry to all the teaching assistants who came after me, but I had written the auto grader script in Perl, and they were still using it for a few semesters after I had graduated. And in my defense, it was maintainable Perl, if such a thing exists. Um, but I'm pretty sure they had rewritten it to Python by now. <laughs> so getting into Facebook was also a bit of an accident. Um, there was a recruiter who said she found my resume in a book in the, from like the School of Computer Science. And I never did find out how it got there. Um, but the recruiter wanted me to do a full loop interview and kind of join as a full-time software engineer. I told her I wanted to do an internship so that I could go back and like finish a fifth year master's. Um, she was so generous to tolerate a request from someone with literally no leverage. And I like to think that I am generally lucky in life, but my interview luck specifically is abysmal 
which is why I've never found another job. <laughs> um, most new grads at the time knew that in the tech industry, you have to do like an outsized number of interviews to even land one offer. But I had failed so many interviews prior to interviewing at Facebook that I assumed I'd be drowning in college debt for like the rest of my life. Um, but however, I mean, despite answering like, well, it's not my first choice to uh, why you want to work at Facebook, <laughs> um, I did do well enough to at least get a internship offer. I, I really don't have um, a lot of insight into how internship return offers um, work back then, but in another bizarre example of like things you shouldn't say to your employer, I actually told my intern manager, I don't know if I want to work for a full-time offer. Um, why did I say that when I literally had no other options? I don't know. Um, thankfully, I did wise up and tell him, um, you know, before the fall ended that I did want an offer. And here I am over eight years later. So by the time I graduated college, my two main interests happened to be security and operating systems. Um, I had a basic security background from like taking courses at Carnegie Mellon and interning at like a security consulting firm. The team I interned with at Facebook still works on security infrastructure today. And when I came back full time, they enticed me to join the team again with some really interesting projects. So the great thing about Facebook during this era was that even a new grad could drive a project as important as securing the master keys. And it's almost funny that I've been at Meta for over eight years because there was a time in my career where I was like seriously at risk of being fired or what engineers call up or out. So when you join Meta as an IC3 or a new grad software engineer, there's a deadline by which you need to progress to IC4. And from IC4, there's a deadline by which you need to progress to IC5. And IC5 is like equivalent to like senior software engineer in most other companies. So I got promoted to IC4 by shipping some medium-sized projects and like working really hard, but I was stuck trying to get to IC5. And you know, I really started to feel the pressure when I was in the yellow zone, which meant that I was more than 50% of the way to the deadline. And if you enter the red zone with no clear path to promotion, it's pretty much game over. Um, my manager was like helping me as much as he could, and I think that had I stayed on the team, I would have gotten to IC5 eventually. But for me, the root of the problem was that I didn't really feel like I was learning anymore. I hit a plateau in like my technical growth. And here's where I got another lucky break. So I was scrolling through our workplace news feed, which is like the equivalent of the Facebook news feed, um, but for work. <laughs> and I saw a post looking for an engineer to work on system D. So for a variety of reasons, the containers team wanted to heavily integrate system D into their systems. Um, and this was kind of hot on the tail of the CentOS 6 to CentOS 7 upgrade when system D first became available. Specifically, they were working, looking for someone to provide dedicated meta support for system D and contribute back to the upstream project. So remember how I said when I graduate university, I was only interested in like security and operating systems? I kind of saw this as an opportunity to finally get back into doing operating systems again. Um, but restarting in a new area on like a new team was also in conflict with my desire to like not get fired. Um, but you know, eventually I decided this was an opportunity that was too exciting to turn down. And I ended up doing a hack a month with the containers team. A hack a month is like an internal mobility program at Meta where you spend a month with another team as like a trial period. And I figured that if the new team didn't pan out, I would just go back to my old one. I spent that entire month working on systemd pull requests. And it had been a few years since I had like touched GitHub, Git, and C. Um, so it's kind of like learning how to ride a bike again, except that the bike could like seg fault and it'll crash your whole operating system. Um, but I was like so ecstatic that month when I got my first pull request merged into systemd. And I was really happy to be contributing to open source and seeing people like and use my code. Maybe some of you can relate, but I get like a huge dopamine hit when I successfully debug an issue. Um, I ended up changing teams and becoming Meta's primary systemd maintainer for a few years. Before I talk about my transition from engineer to manager, let's talk about how I became the stage manager for BrodyCon. 
So a stage manager is the one who's coordinating and organizing a show, usually with a technical crew. And if you're familiar with BronyCon, it's the fan convention for the show My Little Pony. If you were around in the 2010s when the show was really popular, you would know that the fan base was primarily made up of adult males. Um, as you can imagine, I knew a lot of Bronies because I was in a male-dominated major. And one of them was a staff member for BronyCon and needed a stage manager that year. And he asked me because he knew that I had experience stage managing. Um, I had never been to BronyCon, but you know, of course, I'm not gonna turn down an all-expense day in Baltimore, Maryland with a ticket to BronyCon. And also, friendship is magic. But this is not a story about BronyCon. Um, it's a story about how I ended up stage managing, considering my social anxiety. Um, remember how I mentioned I was into art? Um, in middle school, one of the pieces I made was actually displayed at a museum. And the art teacher asked if I was going to go to the Ruth Asawa San Francisco School of the Arts because she wanted to help me with my portfolio and stuff. Um, it was only one of a few, if not probably the only specialized art schools in San Francisco's public high school district. And I told her I considered it, but not for fine arts. I actually wanted to do theater tech. I thought that maybe I would enjoy theater tech as an intersection between like art and hardware. Um, she told me about the audition process and how you actually have to go in and be judged on your abilities as a stagehand. And thanks to my crippling social anxiety, I noped out and went to a regular high school instead. <laughs> but at Carnegie Mellon, I found out there was a student group called AB Tech that did theater tech as like an extracurricular. Um, if you don't know, Carnegie Mellon sells a specific brand of Kool-Aid called Randy Pausch's Last Lecture, and I really drank that up. Like, Randy Pausch's lecture was given in the final months of his life, and he talked about achieving your childhood dreams and like overcoming brick walls. And I wanted to be like Randy Pausch and live my life with no regrets. So I kind of pushed past my social anxiety um, and joined AB Tech, and I'm really glad I did because I loved it so much. I participated for like the remainder of my college career. Um, lighting was my favorite job to do, but I kind of made an attempt to at least try everything once. Um, I just loved helping build a community around AB Tech and working with a team to put on a good show. And it's the same reason why I still volunteer with conventions today. Okay, now let me press the manager portion of this talk with I never want to become a manager. Um, I mean, clearly seeing where I am now, never say never. But given how much I already enjoyed what I was doing with System D, being a manager would put a huge damper on it. Um, because at Meta, the perception is that managers solve people problems. They deal with corporate politics. They don't code. And this style of work generally requires a lot of soft skills. But I like to think that I did go through a lot of personal growth in university. Um, all the stuff I had been doing with AB Tech and being a teaching assistant eventually drove the way that I behaved at work. So much so that my manager asked if I wanted to transition to management. And of course, my immediate reaction was like, heck no. Um, management is like a parallel track to engineering in Meta. That is, you don't get paid more as a manager, you're just doing different work. So why would I want to get paid the same amount for more pain? <laughs> my manager asked me to think about it some more, and I did, because over the course of about six months, he would make pitches about why I should consider management, and I would kind of take that home and sleep on it. So after a few months of this back and forth, I decided I would make the transition. You know, I acknowledge that I was extremely lucky so far to have had a manager that would support my work in open source. So why don't I just pay that forward and do the same for someone else? I figured if it sucks, I can always transition back. And so far, it hasn't sucked enough for me to do that. Um, I haven't been, been a manager that long. It's about two and a half years at this point. I think every manager has like a few horror stories, and I think it's hard to have longevity in this role unless you survive a few trials by fire. For example, within my first year of becoming a manager, Meta had their first ever layoff. Imagine the mass panic and confusion as you try to be a rock of emotional stability for your team. And as an engineer turned manager, you also have like the constant thought of transitioning back. At one point, I seriously thought like, you know, I'll transition back when we land this migration to open source. But then you like find another shiny project and you can't help but like stick around to help your team land like the next open source initiative. 
And if these past couple of years have taught me anything, it's that adaptability and motivation are kind of like big parts of staying in the manager role. It's kind of like keeping the show going until the end, even when your light board freezes. So at this point in my life, my mom has finally stopped making commentary like, aren't you worried about not having any girls in your class? Um, by the final exam of my undergraduate computer architecture class, I was kind of the only woman left. Um, my mom's probably tired of bringing it up at this point, or maybe she thinks it doesn't matter. But it's a bit better now. Instead of being the only woman in the room today, I am one of several women. But I'm still not ready to tell her that yet. All right. So like, what was, you know, what was this all about? Um, life is a ride. Enjoy it. Never turn down an opportunity for fun and shenanigans. Pay it forward. I wouldn't be where I am today without people like Ms. Cornbluth, Jessica, and everyone else who propped me up along the way. And friendship is truly magic. Nothing is quite as strong as a band of enthusiasts. Be excellent to each other. OK, thank you for listening, and have a great day at Flock. I did end up getting a bachelor's in electrical and computer engineering. Yes. All right, no questions. We're out of time. <laughs> <laughs>